Now that all of the individual levels are complete, it will be great if we have an overview scene to tie them all together. In this video, you'll see how we turned this doodle we made a long time ago into this. Stay tuned to see it happen. You might remember these concept doodles from an earlier episode in the series. We then enhanced these concepts in Figma with nicer sprites that were more or less scaled to their final dimensions. The four designs as you see are the main menu, gameplay scenes, scoreboard and map selection screen. We made all but the last one. You can check out in the playlist in the description if you want to see how we made the other scenes. Here we have the space background tiles. We want to make a large version of this for the map selection screen. We're going to create a new file in a sprite. I'll set the size to 1024 by 576 pixels to match the game, and I'll fill the canvas with a dark blue color. Let's rename the layer to BG to stay organized. We're going to have several layers on this canvas, and let's also set the grid size to 32 by 32 pixels. We're going to add the UI elements like the back button. This is so that we can see how detailed the background needs to be, you'll see later. Create a new layer and call it button. Paste it and position it nicely on the top left corner. Like in the concept we have, the button is on the top left and the total star amount is on the right. To save time, I'm just going to select a few tile spaces and color them in a light blue color. This part will be replaced in Godot with a star sprite and numbers. Now back in our animated background tile, it will be tedious to copy each frame and paste it on the new background. So what we're going to do is go to File and Export Sprite Sheet. And then just click on Export. Now we have all the frames in one single row and of course the grids are all messed up, so I have to fix that quickly. Select everything and then go back to our new background file. Create a new layer and call it stars. Paste the star sheet on the bottom right corner. Now we're going to copy one part of the sheet and start pasting them randomly across the canvas. And we'll repeat that with each frame. The reason I'm doing this is because the background will not be animated, and I don't want too many stars since it won't be the main focus of the screen. Looks nice, now we can make the island sprites. First we make a new layer and call it levels, since the levels are on islands. And then make a small selection and with the eyedropper tool select the wooden brown color from the button and fill the selected space. Now we can copy and paste the selection across the map in a zigzag pattern. The pattern will probably be changed later but bear with me for now. We have to make sure that there's enough space to fit 18 of these. Okay, it sort of fits. So what we have to do now is to make some dotted lines as you would see on a treasure map. Now let's make this block look like an island. Grab the little block and create a new file. It will automatically select the size as your selection. We're going to reuse the sprites from the sprite sheet. First we need to make them a bit smaller. So go to sprite and sprite size and then just make it twice as small and press OK. Set the grid to 16 by 16 to make it easier to select the tiles. Now we copy and paste the island edges in the new file and make an island. After that, add the flag tile on the right side. Then the plain grass to fill the insides. Then copy the flag again because I'm stupid and forgot to place the flag on a separate layer. Now we need the rails, but since this is just a placeholder art, I'll copy the rail color and draw a few lines. But I think it should be thicker, so let's add more lines. And with the help of the grid, use the second color to make a red and white pattern. Copy what we've made and paste it back in the level selection screen. Since this looks pretty decent, let's remove all the brown rectangles and replace them with the island. I should also note that this sprite represents our first map, map 1. What we would like to do is to make all of these maps look like what you would play in the gameplay mode. So here I'll just quickly make another map that's in the game. And then we put it on the map selection screen. You can kind of tell what kind of map this is going to be. With the islands in place, let's make some stars to see how well you've played the map. Using the grid, I'll focus on just drawing on the left side and paste the mirrored version next to it. This sort of looks like a star, so let's place one next to it and one in the middle. In a new file using horizontal symmetry, try to make another star that doesn't look so awful, and then replace it on the map selection screen. The lines will be tricky, since they might not be straight like this in the game. But these lines I've made between the maps actually gave me enough space to fit them in. So let's make them look nicer. Create a new file that's 64 by 64 pixels, and then with a very chunky brush, draw a diagonal dotted line. 
then go to frame and new frame. This will copy the frame we have, so all we have to do is flip it horizontally. Let's see how this looks on the map selection screen. Like But I'll be fixing the polishing up video, so until then, a similar design for the straight line. So all of this looks nice for now, and we see there's enough space for all the UI elements. All of the assets we've just made have their own A sprite file, and this is the background file. Thankfully, we made all of these sprites in their own layer, so all we have to do now is hide them and then just leave the BG and stars layer. If you've ever used software like this, I'm sure you know the pain of accidentally drawing everything on one layer. After some thinking, the islands need some more space under them to have the stars in them. Well, they don't have to, but it makes them look way nicer. And when we paste it all on the map selection screen and remove the grid, this is roughly what the game will look like in the end, with a bit better graphics of course. Now that all the temporary assets are done, here's the development side of things. Let's start putting things together. I'll create a new scene and call it Level Select Island. The purpose of this scene will be twofold. It will serve as a button to go to levels that you've unlocked and as an indicator for the score you've earned in already completed levels. I'm going to drag in the island sprite as well as three stars. I need to make sure that the texture filtering option is set to nearest for all the sprites to give them that sharp pixel art look. After that I need to put each star into its respective placeholder. To make the island look more interesting, I'm going to add an animation player node called Float Animation. I think you can guess what it's going to do. I'll create a single animation track called Float and make it 2 seconds long. The property I wish to animate is the offset of the island sprite, so I'll add it to the timeline by clicking the little key next to it. I'll add the static keyframes first to the beginning and end of the animation. Then I'll add one last keyframe into the middle and edit the Y coordinate to have a value of 5. This will vertically offset the sprite by 5 pixels. Now when I preview the animation you'll notice that, annoyingly, only the island itself is moving, not the stars. <sighs> Before I move on to the stars, I'll set the easing property to ease in out to give the animation a more natural look. To animate the stars, I'll simply add their offset properties to the timeline as well. Then I'll repeat the process. I'll add static keyframes to the beginning and end, and another keyframe in the middle where I'll adjust the Y offset as well as the easing. There we go, much better. For the finishing touches, I'll make the animation autoplay and loop. I'll preview the scene. We can see the island floating in the top left corner. It's not looking too bad so far. I want to add another animation player for islands that have just been unlocked. I'll call it Modulate Animation because I want to animate the color. It's going to have a single animation called Reveal. Under the island's visibility section, I'm going to find the Modulate property and add it to the timeline. I'll insert a keyframe to the beginning and end just like before, then I'll change the first keyframe to be a dark grey color. When I preview the animation you can see that the island is slowly being revealed. Let's also adjust the easing property. Ease in looks better. Interestingly, the modulate animation applied to all the elements at once, unlike the offset animation which had to be applied to each element individually. Let's add some logic now to conditionally show the stars. The first thing we need is a script. I'll accept the default name of Level Select Island. Then on top of the script I'll define an integer called score. This will just track the number of stars we've earned in a given level. Then on the bottom I'll define a method called reveal stars. This method will check our score variable and show the correct number of stars. I need to make sure to actually call the method before previewing the scene. I'll call it here in the ready method. There it is. When the score is 0, none of the stars are shown. Let's move on to the level select scene now. I'll create a new scene for it. I'm going to change the root node into a sprite 2D and drag in the space background. Then I'm going to add a blank node 2D called levels which will simply be used to group all the levels. Now I'll drag in a level select island into the scene and duplicate it 18 times, once for each playable level. Then I'll spend some time adjusting the placement of the islands. I'll try to place 6 per row so we can have an even distribution. 
Now, I'll repeat the same process for the lines. I'll create another blank Node 2D called Lines to serve as a container for the sprites. Then, I'll add a Sprite 2D node as a child and drag the level Select Line PNG over it. Remember to set the texture filtering property to nearest to give the sprite a sharp look. Same for the background as well. I'll create 18 copies of the lines and start placing them. Notice, however, that the lines show up above the islands. We don't want this. I'll raise the z-index value of the islands to deal with this. Notice how the lines are now underneath the islands. That looks much better. Now I'll just continue putting the lines into place. I'll also rotate and scale the lines as I go along. It kind of looks like a wacky cartoon map. It turns out that 17 lines would have been enough, so I'll just delete the last one. Great, the placement of the elements is complete. Now I'll head back to the level select island script and add some more variables on top. Unlocked, which will determine whether a given island is clickable or not, and level name, which will determine the name of the scene to load when the island is clicked. However, none of the nodes we have right now have any signals to detect mouse input. To get around this, I'll add an Area 2D node with a square collision shape. Area 2D grants us access to an input event signal. I'll double click it and attach it to our existing script. In here, I'll add some logic to check if we have received a mouse button event, if so, and if the level in question is unlocked, then we switch scenes to the selected level. Before we can actually try this out, I need to assign a level name to each island. I'll also mark the first two levels as unlocked for testing purposes. Let's see this in action now. And there it is! Clicking on the first two levels successfully loads them up in the game. One thing I don't like about the floating islands is how they're all perfectly in sync. Let's add some variety to this. In the Float Animation node, I'm going to untick the Autoplay option. This will naturally disable the animation altogether as you can see here. So, let's add a Timer node as a child of the Float Animation node. I'll call it Start Animation Timer. The Wait Time property doesn't matter here. We'll randomize that via code. The only thing I want to edit here in the Inspector is the One Shot property. I'll turn it on to make sure that the timer stops after triggering. Back in the script, in the ready method, I'll define a new random number generator and a random time that will range between 100 and 500 milliseconds. Now I'll assign the random value to the timer's wait time property and start the timer. The next step is to connect the timer's timeout signal. When it times out, we simply play the float animation. Let's preview. Whoops, looks like we have a little bug. I'll just correctly assign the wait time over here. If I preview the scene now, we see that the islands are out of sync thanks to the timer's random offset. That looks much better. Let's create a visual distinction between locked and unlocked levels. I'll untick level 2's unlocked property for now. We're done testing that. For every locked level, I want to darken its modulate property. I'll do this in the script. Here's a tip. If you ever forget how to reference a property in the code, you can copy its path via this context menu option, Copy Property Path. I'll go back to the script and add a condition to the top of the ready method. If the island is not unlocked, I'll edit the modulate property. Modulate takes a color with 3 to 4 parameters depending on if you want alpha or not. For our purposes, we only care about RGB. Each value is a float that ranges from 0 to 1, 0 is pitch black, and 1 is the original color. I'll set each color to 0.2 to make the sprite pretty dark. If we preview the scene now, we can see that all of the locked levels have been darkened while one level remains lit up. This will clearly indicate to the player which levels are playable. I'm happy with this for now. Let's move on. Now that we finally have a level select scene, we can revisit the main menu that we made several episodes ago and actually hook up the play button. We never created a script for the main menu, so let's do that now. I'm happy to accept main menu as the default name. We won't be needing the ready and process method, so goodbye. Now that we have a script to attach our signals to, I'll go to the signal browser and connect the pressed signal on the play button. The method will simply change the scene to our brand new level select scene. Let's run the scene. Wow, look at that. The play button finally does something after all this time. We can even load up a playable level. You know what else we can do? We can finally assign a main scene to the game. 
I'll press on the main play button to get Godot to prompt me to set a main scene. From this dialog box, I'll just click on Select Current. Now, every time I launch the game, it will load up the main menu. While we're at it, let's revisit another old scene, the UI overlay this time, and let's hook up the buttons. We want the main menu button to load up the main menu scene, of course. Then with the replay button we want to reload the current scene. And then finally the next level button will load our brand new level select scene. The next requirement is for the levels to be able to identify themselves. To solve this, I'll simply add a new level number variable to the gameplay script. Now I'll go through each level and assign it its respective level number. I could have probably done this using a regular expression on the level name, but I opted for a quick and dirty solution instead. Next I want to start implementing the ability to unlock levels on the level select screen. In order to do this, we need to pass some data between scenes. I'll create a new folder called Scripts and a script called Global. In here, I'll define a dictionary called Scores, which will contain the score we've achieved in each level. I'll use minus one as a placeholder for levels that haven't been beaten yet. As you might know, we can't pass data between scenes directly. Instead, we store the data in a loose script like this. Then, we can auto-load these scripts into all other scripts via the project settings, effectively creating global variables. So, how do we set these scores? I'll open up the gameplay script again and navigate to the on-hole entered method which is triggered when you complete a level. I'll extend this method a little bit. Let's define a stars earned integer. Then, let's work out how many stars we've earned based on the number of shots taken and the condition for the confusingly named gold and silver scores. Once we've worked it out, we assign the number of stars to the global dictionary we defined a moment ago. Let's go back to the level select scene now. I'm going to assign a script to the root node and simply call it level select. We're going to loop through each level number using a range and check if the recorded score is greater than minus 1. If the score is greater than minus 1, that means the level has been beaten already. In that case, we want to assign the score to the respective island node. Also, we want to toggle the next island in the list and mark it as unlocked. I'll also adjust the range to go from 1 to 18. I don't know what I was thinking there. One more minor change. In the ready method of the islands, we darken them if they're locked. Let's extend the condition to reset the modulate property if the island is unlocked. Also, I'm going to move the if block from ready to process. This is because the islands ready method gets triggered before the level selects ready method. Let's play a quick game. I'm going to beat a few levels. Notice how I'm progressively unlocking the levels one by one. But wait, the star indicators are still empty. What's up with that? Well, it turns out that I simply forgot to call the reveal stars method that I wrote a few minutes ago. Let's do another play test. I'll try to beat the first level in two shots so I only get two stars. Notice how two stars light up on the first island. Let's play the second level and get a hole in one. And look at that, all three stars lit up. Success. That's pretty much it for all the playable scenes. We're getting pretty close to finishing the game. However, the game still feels pretty janky, as you can probably tell from the footage. Join us next time when we apply a thick, chunky layer of polish to make the game ready for release. In the meantime, check out the linked playlist in case you missed any episodes in the series. Don't forget to like and subscribe to stay up to date. Thanks for watching and see you soon.